Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to the EOL seminar series. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Daniel Kirschbaum, who is an associate professor at McGill University in Montreal in the Department of Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences. Dan's education reads as a feat of engineering with degrees in both electrical and mechanical engineering that finished with a PhD in atmospheric sciences at the University of Washington in Seattle. I am very pleased to mention that Dan was an ASP postdoc at M cubed with Rich Rotuno. This was followed by research positions in such hallowed institutions as Yale University in Connecticut and the University of Reading in Reading, UK. Currently at McGill, Dr. Kirschbaum presides over an army of graduate students doing research in mesoscale dynamics and convection in all its permutations. Dan's current projects revolve around deep convection, cumulus entrainment, orographic induced precipitation, and parameterization of shallow and deep convection in large scale models, which segues into today's seminar, which covers a number of these research themes. The, uh, the seminar title is Large Eddy Simulation of Convection Initiation over Heterogeneous Low Terrain. We are using Slido to post questions, which you can ask at any time during the seminar. The Slido window is located at the bottom of this presentation screen. Please don't be alarmed if you don't see your question. We're archiving most questions that will be revealed during the Q&A portion of this talk at the end of the pres presentation. Dr. Dan Kirschbaum, we welcome you to EOL, and the virtual stage is now yours. Thank you very much, Jackie, for the nice introduction. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, so yeah, uh, I was a postdoc at NCAR uh, from 2004 to 2006, and I don't think I've been back since. I don't know if this qualifies uh, since I'm not actually in Boulder, but in any case, it's it's good to be back, and uh, you know, hopefully, some people that I know are in the audience. So today, I'll be talking about large eddy simulations of convection initiation over heterogeneous low terrain. And let's start with uh, the background. So I don't really, I don't need to tell you this background, I'm sure you all know it, but I'll run through it anyway. Um, mountains are hotspots of convection initiation, particularly during the daytime, due to two main effects. Uh, one is they help to precondition the atmosphere for convection, and secondly, they produce a lot of vertical motion uh, that helps to initiate convection. So the preconditioning um, comes from a few different places a few different sources. One, and perhaps the most important, is, is that mountains, by virtue of being tall, uh, sit above nocturnal inversion layers that are negatively buoyant and want to sink into valleys. Um, so over uh, higher terrain, there tends to be reduced convective inhibition because of the absence of nocturnal inversion layers. Although uh, the amount, the moisture content of the atmosphere almost always decreases with height, um, that means, well, the fact that moisture decreases with height means that mountaintops generally have less moisture available to them than the surroundings. But if the mountains can draw air from the surroundings, from lower levels oh, up to the crests, um, then that can be very favorable for convection. And that's what happens with thermal circulations that often occur uh, during the daytime. And then once moisture reaches the mountaintop, uh, if it's just ventilated into the free troposphere uh, through clouds or just through dry turbulence, it then moistens the mid-levels, which can have an impact on subsequent convection, basically making it more favorable for uh, the next updraft pulse to um, go deeper than the previous one. Uh, in terms of dynamic forcing, there's two main effects. One that I call uh, that that can be called mechanical is the mountain acting as an obstacle to impinging flow. Uh, the flow can go over the mountain, which obviously induces there's vertical motion over the the sort of windward slope. 
or the flow can detour around a mountain where there can be vertical motion both upstream and or downstream. So you might see uh, cumulus convection forming, not over, but um, sort of on one side of the mountain. And then there's thermal forcing, and this has all to do with uh, horizontal baroclinicity in the atmosphere. Um, during the daytime, when mountains are heated by the sun, they become warmer than the surrounding air at the same level, which is not heated by the sun, uh, which corresponds to a horizontal buoyancy gradient and a thermally direct circulation with ascent over the mountaintop. Now this can be through wind, winds can affect where this ascent occurs, but it tends to occur over the higher terrain in this case. Uh, during the nighttime, it's kind of the opposite picture where drainage flows tend to initiate convection near the base of the mountain. Um, thermal heating can also, thermal forcing can also interact with uh, mechanical forcing. You can have low level convergence due to uh, heating of the slopes, but then an upper level gravity wave and if those two kind of align vertically, then there can be strong convection. So just to say that mountains uh, both make the atmosphere more favorable for convection and produce the ascent needed to initiate it. Most of the work that's been done on orography in the atmosphere, particularly the orographic effects on convection is focused on larger mountains. This is just a figure from Howes et al. 2012 showing um, some satellite based study over the Himalayas here in India and the Western Ghats. You see that these mountain ranges with huge precipitation amounts uh, in the uh, monsoon period. And then we also have South America with the Amazon and then the Andes here. And, and their studies have kind of focused on major convection episodes in, in both of these regions. Um, of course, other regions have been studied, like the Rockies and the Alps and, and many, many other large mountain ranges. But we often don't think about small scale terrain variability being important for deep convection. And it's not well resolved in large scale models. So it could be problematic um, in some situations, or it could be if it makes a difference, then it's something that uh, may need to be accounted for in models that can't actually uh, represent it. So the question here um, is, do small scale terrain heterogeneities impact convection, uh, convection initiation? And if so, they're kind of important because they're ubiquitous over the globe and I'll show some examples. Um, and if, 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 we if it makes a significant difference, particularly to the atmospheric radiation budget, then it's something that, that we do have to worry about. So here is just, uh, just a part of the world topography shown. This is obviously the East Coast of the United States, Southeastern Canada. Um, I'm here in Montreal in this valley, uh, St. Lawrence Valley. And I, what I'm showing on the left is a portion of the terrain over Alabama, Mississippi. This is not known to be an area that has much terrain to it. Um, there is the Appalachian Mountains that, that extend into Northern Alabama. But what you see is kind of a terrain field that's sort of pockmarked by these uh, deep river valleys and then surrounded by more heterogeneous terrain. So you see kind of larger scale variability of the terrain except over the higher terrain where it mm, seems to be a bit more smaller scale. Here's another picture looking at the Ohio River Valley. I will also point out that you see variations of around 200 meters here in Alabama. Um, Ohio River Valley, we see variations of up to maybe 500 meters. And here you see you know, there are the river valleys again, you see some higher terrain. Again, it looks very rugged um, in the higher terrain regions, less so in the lower terrain regions. And then up here in central Quebec, um, it's kind of a similar picture. Now there's 500 meters of terrain relief. Again, a kind of scattered picture of ups and downs of the terrain. It's, and, and all of these boxes that I'm showing are sort of, uh, correspond to something like 150 by two or around 200 by 200 kilometer grid box. So our models, um, you know, climate models would, let's say today running at 50 by 50 kilometers would still include a large portion of this variability. So the objectives are to quantify the impacts of modest terrain on convection initiation 
using quasi-idealized numerical simulations, and then to physically interpret these effects. Um, obviously, if we get a signal, if, 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 if this modest heterogeneous type terrain is, is important and we see a signal, we want to understand uh, what's causing it. So the case that I've chosen, and this is you know, a bit arbitrary, there's many cases one could choose to simulate, in, an, in a modeling experiment, one always needs to sort of make decisions to constrain uh, the problem. And here I've chosen a well-defined and very well-constrained case of convection initiation. Some of you may be familiar with it. Uh, it's called the Large Scale Biosphere Atmosphere L or LBA experiment in Am Amazonia. Um, it was the subject of a GCSS uh, working group, working group four. And it, there was a um, sort of model intercomparison Paris, a paper by Grabowski et al. 2006. This uh, picture is taken from Karutinov and Randall 2006. And they did a study of this particular case at 100 meters grid spacing over a large domain and found that it took a while for deep convection to develop uh, over the diurnal cycle. This is, sort of starts at 7.30 local time. So it goes to about a little after 1 p.m. in the afternoon. Um, and you see that convection slowly, very gradually deepens during the day and then more suddenly grows from around four kilometers up to maybe 12 kilometers later in the day. What uh, was found in the simulation, in these large eddy simulations of Karutinov and Randall was that convection initiation was delayed for, or even though the convective inhibition was gone by you know, maybe half an hour into the simulation, the convection initiation was delayed until four point, or around four to six hours into the simulation. And their explanation was that the key was the formation of precipitation in these more, in the shallower type congestus type clouds, which then gave rise to subcloud cold pools um, that gave more, that uh, produced more organized forcing, larger scale forcing in the subcloud layer that initiated larger thermals that were then able to withstand the effects of entrainment uh, and detrainment or atmosphere and mixing with the surrounding atmosphere as they ascended. So uh, the point I'd like to make though, an important point is this is, this is just a viable configuration. It's not that I'm trying to make conclusions about Amazonia, about convection over Amazonia specifically. So if you are a reviewer of the paper that has been, that I submitted, um, just note that I am not trying to say that these results are specific to the Amazon. I am only using this as a, sort of a starting point to choose this case. So the modeling that I'll use is uh, the Brian Cloud model, and I'm sure that's familiar to most members of the audience. Um, so I'm not gonna talk uh, in detail about it, um, other than to say I'm using uh, the Wino type advection scheme for velocity and scalars, which is quite uh, important to remove oscillations that can occur in, in cloud fields, um, spurious oscillations. It's a very diffusive, diffusive scheme, so it doesn't give a great uh, power spectrum, but it does eliminate um, this tendency for, cloud, for a single cloud to initiate multiple clouds and thereby lead to more rapid overturning of convective layers than, than would re really occur. Uh, the domain uh, is, uh, has a size of 120 by 120 kilometers, so it's a pretty large horizontal domain um, and then a height of 20 kilometers. The nominal grid spacing is 250 meters in the horizontal and 100 meters in the vertical. And for those of you who do large eddy simulation or are aware of it, this is pretty marginal. It's not a great uh, grid resolution. I will show higher resolution simulations, but um, all of the results will be robust to the grid resolution. So um, if that's a burning question, I'm sorry that I just took away your thunder, no pun intended. So here's what the initial uh, state looks like. The initial sounding is shown here. Now, as you might expect, uh, this is straight from the Grabowski et al. paper. Um, it's mostly a pseudo adiabatic looking sounding with a little bit of conditional instability, a cape of 100, 1 and 200 joules per kilogram, sin, barely any sin, maybe, maybe five joules per kilogram. 
Um, the forcings at this, you see there's some winds too. This is uh, each half barb is five meters per second. So there's um, some weak winds and, and a little bit of wind shear. Actually, it's a sort of reverse shear from our mid-latitude perspective. It's westerly at low levels and easterly aloft. Um, low level um, or the surface heating function is shown here. Sensible reaches about 300 watts per meter squared and latent reaches over 550. This is uh, the tropics, of course. And the terrain, um, so this is a purely idealized terrain. I'm not sort of taking any real terrain and plugging it into the simulation. Um, what I'd like to do is make it representative of the, the sort of pictures that we saw before of the hilly terrains in, in the eastern half of this continent. And all the trains have a mean height of 100 meters. So regardless, every case has a mean height of 100 meters. Every case with terrain then has a maximum height of 200 and a minimum height of zero. So the maximum relief in every case is 200 meters. And the reason that I keep the relief fixed is because that's often taken to be the number one terrain effect is, is or the terrain parameters, the height of the terrain. So I wanna keep that fixed so I, to make it easier to attribute the changes that I see to other aspects of the terrain. So the way I do it is I design a power spectrum and wave number space, um, randomize the phases and invert back to physical space. And what sort of guidance, observational guidance am I going to use for what power spectrum for the terrain should be used? Um, well, this is back from a paper in 2007 where uh, with uh, George Bryan and Rich Fortuno as co-authors. And we looked at the uh, coastal range in Western Oregon and found it had something resembling a kappa to the minus five thirds type of slope. That is similar to, you know, isotropic homogeneous turbulence in the atmosphere, but these terrains are not homogeneous and isotropic. They, isotropic. they have a lot of uh, sort of, correlations, uh, you know, a lot of detail uh, between different uh, and relationships between different modes that this power spectrum doesn't quite, just the amplitude alone doesn't capture. So, but still, I'm going to take kappa to the minus five thirds as sort of the most realistic power spectrum. And then I make two others sort of like with um, more larger scale, amplitude and another with more smaller scale amplitude. So I have one case where the, the terrain spectrum uh, follows kappa to the first, and that's this kp1, kappa to the positive one. That's shown here. So it's very small scale, a very rugged terrain. So I'm going to use the word rugged to describe very, a lot of small scale variability. The kappa to the minus five third case shown in green here, now, all of these cases are cut off at six delta x to make sure that we don't force the model at scales it has trouble resolving. Uh, the kappa to the minus five thirds is shown here. Uh, this one has a large eddy scale of 20 kilometers, meaning that 20 kilometers is the peak forcing, sort of where the energy is kind of injected, um, if you think in a turbulent sense. Um, so it weakens at both larger scales and smaller scales. And then kappa to the minus five thirds is shown here. So it just has more power in the larger scales than kappa to the minus five thirds. So here's a comparison of the control case with the kappa to the minus five thirds terrain. And what I'm plotting is wind vectors um, and cloud water path. That's just the integrated hydrometeor content multiplied by density, uh, vertically integrated. Now, when you watch, it's hard to watch this. Um, you know, watch two movies happening at the same time, but I'll sort of, I'll draw your attention to what happens, which is the clouds first develop in the case with terrain. They develop first in that case, and they also deepen first in that case. And you'll see these larger values of uh, cloud water path uh, develop over the KM53 case first. They eventually develop over this, the control case too. But they, what we see is sort of larger cloud structures and a more rapid onset or a more rapid initiation of deep convection happening. And again, all of the this terrain has a peak height of 200 meters. So it's not really what one would consider to be a very significant terrain, but it 
does have a noticeable impact on the convection initiation. Now I'm not going to talk about very much about what specific processes occur when these deeper clouds develop. Um, I've had a look at the simulations and it looks a lot like Banta's mechanism of lee side convergence that downstream of some of these larger terrain features, we do have uh, convergence lines where uh, these storms develop. Um, I'm not, not getting too much into the mechanisms because um, that's sort of, I think I feel like very consistent with, with past studies and I'd like to focus more on why this terrain helps to initiate deep convection and also how the terrain spectrum influences uh, the initiation of deep convection. Shown here is um, time series from those four simulations. The control is, a, is the flat simulation KP1 with more rugged terrain, KM3 smoother, or KM53 smoother than KM3, the smoothest of all. So the, what we see in cloud top height is that the kappa to the minus third terrain um, develops convection the first, now it, 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 or the fastest, I should say. What's shown in gray are an ensemble of KM53 uh, members. So this is sort of the range of what we might expect from this green kappa to the minus five third case. And you see that although it's not definitive proof of statistical significance, the kappa to the minus third case is at least during this early initiation period is mostly outside of the range of kappa to the minus five thirds, suggesting that it's a systematic trend. Kappa to the one, we, it doesn't initiate convection much faster than having no terrain at all. I mean, these could be from a similar, the same ensemble. So despite having this extremely rugged terrain, the kappa to the one case doesn't uh, promote convective initiation. Whereas kappa to the minus five thirds and kappa to the minus third do. And these same trends are found in the volume integrated mass flux shown here and the area averaged rainfall shown here. So it's about a two to three hour expediting of deep convection that occurs uh, in the KM3 case compared to the control case. You can see that about two to three of these ticks um, separate, let's say when the cloud first hits 10 kilometers in both cases or 12 kilometers. And this, the scale of the terrain forcing is important because when the scale is very small, like the K, KP1 case, uh, it doesn't help convection initiation much, but when the dominant scales are large, it does. So that's kind of the big question that now I'm going to try to answer. Why is the smoother terrain? So KM3 and KM53, Obviously control is a very smooth terrain, it's flat. But then once we have mountains, we have the sort of smoother varying mountains and then more ruggedly varying mountains. And the smoother ones are more effective at initiating convection. So the first place to look, the first place one looks if you do convection is to see if there's a difference in the fuel or the, the low level conditions. Maybe we have more humidity uh, more instability in one case than the other due to say diff different mixing uh, with the free troposphere. Looking at these profiles, this is at t equals two hours. So this is right at the beginning of the initiation period. Um, and what we see, the big difference is in the turbulent kinetic energy. We have much of the highest turbulent kinetic energy in the boundary layer in the KP1 case. And this might make sense because we have a lot of terrain variability, um, occurring and that a variability on its own plus any turbulence that is induced by it is enhancing uh, the turbulent kinetic energy, particularly in the subcloud layer. But looking at the actual fields themselves, potential temperature, water vapor mixing ratio, U and V, we don't see any differences that are significant that are large enough to explain the differences we see in convection. And I say that because the kappa to the minus five three and the kappa to the minus third tend to fall in the middle of the other two cases. You can see that with QV. These are the extreme cases, or KM3 is the extreme case where convection initiates the fastest. And it's not on the extreme here. It's right in the middle. Same with uh, 
you know, it's U, it's U and V and it does have a cooler uh, theta in the boundary layer, which isn't necessarily favorable for convection. It's just indicative maybe of, of less mixing, which we sort of see in the TKE profile. But there's nothing really here to suggest that, that the KM53 and KM3 cases um, have sort of more instability or more moisture to, uh, to, to work with than the others. So we have to look, we have to look somewhere else. Um, and looking at the power spectra of vertical velocity at the level of free convection, uh, that's what's shown here on the right. I'm now comparing the four cases. So again, I'm showing the terrain power spectra here just to kind of give you uh, some reference. And what we see is that as the terrain forcing increases, the forcing on the meso, the micro scale forcing does not change much. You know, it looks these micro scale profiles mostly align. But then we see differences on the mesoscale, particularly with KM3 and KM53 having a, a peak at around 20 kilometers. You clearly see that here, and that's the dominant terrain forcing scale. So it all makes sense. This really isn't turbulence that we're seeing. This is organized uh, circulations on the mesoscale. So they're, they're not really cascading energy down to the micro scale. They're just holding the energy there. Now, the fact that we have enhanced forcing at larger scales um, plays into a narrative that has been circulating around for a while, which is that there is a relationship between cloud area and in particular, the initial width of a cloud when it breaches the level of free convection and the ultimate height that it reaches. This is a paper by my previous MSc student, Rafael Russo Rizzi, from 2017, where he did scatter plots. He did a, used a Lagrangian thermal tracking code and applied it to three different simulations. The only thing that each one of these uh, plots is a different simulation. They only vary in the mid-level relative humidity. So all we can do is just look at the center one and, and the, the point comes across that as the initial area increases, so does the heights that are reached by these clouds. Now the the explanation for this is, the sim uh, is a simple explanation that um, when a cloud has a larger area, if you imagine that the mixing along the cloud edges does not change as the cloud area increases. So there's, there will be more mixing because the cloud is larger, but the mixing you know, per unit distance along the cloud edge say, does not change. If that's the case, then, then the air that comes in, the increased entrainment will scale with the cloud perimeter, but that has to be diluted through the whole cloud area. And so you get this one over radius dependence. So a lot of research has found results that are consistent with that idea. Um, so that's how we explained this at the time. And I'm going to perform a similar core track, uh, cloud core tracking or thermal tracking um, using the same type of analysis. So um, what I do is it, at a given time, I identify all points that are called that are cloud convective cores with positive W, positive cloud water, this is uh, liquid and ice and buoyancy. And then every region of interconnected points is a cloud core. And then at one minute intervals, um, I do, I check for overlap between cloud cores. So I look at successive model output times at one minute intervals and identify the core points. And then by doing that, I can track a uh, core over time, have to take care of splits and mergers and all of that, all of that good stuff. Here's just an example of how this tracking works. And we're looking, so that I'm only doing tracking over two to three hours of the simulation because, um, it's over this period that we really see the big difference in cloud top height develop. So here is it, it just two hours, one minute. And at this time, you just see some very weak looking cores, you know, low cloud water path. And I've identified a thermal. There is a, a thermal here that's identified by the black dot. Now, the only thermals that I show in this plot are ones that reach a height of over three kilometers. Most thermals do not reach that height. So this only shows a few of them, particularly this one that starts off at 121 minutes 
You see that one moving, it's developed into much, has much higher cloud water path now. There's another thermal nearby it that is also growing cloud water path. You see these two new thermals come into the scene. And then by, by 180 minutes, this one thermal that started off as this black dot over here turns into this big whopping uh, sort of multi-cell storm. Um, you can see that its track looks pretty jagged, and that's that's mainly because what I'm the center of the track is the maximum vertical velocity in the core, and that's that's a pretty um, highly variable fluctuating quantity. And so, let's say a, a single core can have multiple thermals inside of it, so it might be jumping from one thermal to another. Um, this this line, but still, it maintains the track over time, and that's what's important. So then, you know, we can take this uh, tracking algorithm out for out for a drive, and the, you know, let's start with the initial um, initial properties of clouds. What I'm look, looking at here is histograms of the area at the level of free convection, um, the maximum vertical velocity at the level of free convection, the mean ver vertical velocity, and the time integrated mass flux over the first 10 minutes of the core of the life cycle of the core. So all of these are measured over the first 10 minutes. Um, this is the ALFC is the maximum area over that time. W max is the maximum W inside that core. And then W mean is the mean W over that whole time. Now, what we see uh, from, the, from these plots is that there's a, a major increase in area, in the initial area of these thermals. It's just, you, you know, the control case does, does basically it's, they're half as large as in most of these uh, terrain cases. Now we get mostly small cores in all of the cases, but we do get a handful of larger cores. And these are the ones that really make the difference. You know, we're looking in a domain of 120 by 120 kilometers and all you need is one core to, to go deep and then that changes the whole story. Um, so you see a, a large increase in area and that's in all the terrain cases, but particularly in the KM3 and KM53 cases. We also see an increase in W max at the LFC, so stronger updrafts. And then the mass flux shows the most systematic uh, sensitivity where it's very weak. It's the weakest for the flat case, somewhat stronger, for KP1, very rugged terrain, and then it kind of has a long tail for the other two cases. So we see a large, de we see a large decrease in the number of small cores as we go from the control to the KM3 case, and a handful of uh, larger cores with stronger vertical velocities. Then uh, we can statistically analyze, sort of like what Russo Rizzi did, but this is instead of showing a scatter plot, this is uh, like a box and whisker plot where we use bin, where I use bins of all of these initial control variables and then compare that to the maximum height reached by the top of the thermal over this two to three hour period. Now, you, what you see is that regardless of the control parameter, if it's the initial area, if it's the initial, uh, if it's the maximum vertical velocity, or if it's the, the mass flux, we do see a systematic increase, except for that there's some weirdness um, for weak values of W, which I don't quite understand, but that doesn't show up in the mass flux. Um, and we get the strongest correlation, like a Spearman correlation of around 0.7 between initial mass flux and ultimate cloud top height. It's only about 0.3 for the area and it's in between in the uh, W max. But they all, they're all very statistically significant. And I'm going to look at both the area at the LFC and the mass flux at the LFC as initial control parameters here. So these show pretty clear sensitivities. This is looking at different quantities inside the cores. So this is the maximum buoyancy, maximum vertical velocity, and maximum hydrometeor content inside the cores. So what I do is for each core, I find the maximum at each level at each time. And that constitute, at each level, that constitutes a new sample. And then over all the cloud cores, over all times, I then average those maximum, maximum values. And you see that there's a systematic 
sensitivity as as the initial area gets larger we have initial uh, the, the maxima increase in all of these quantities now um, you can use mass flux initial mass flux is that initial variable and you get a very similar story you could say well it's a stronger sensitivity but it is sensitive to how you set these bins um, but in any case we still see the we still see that same sensitivity that as there's more area of the initial the initial core is larger or has a larger mass flux um, all of its properties it's subsequent development tends to be uh, more vigorous. So why is that? Well, we can turn to the bulk entrainment and detrainment calculations. And these are showing profiles of, of bulk entrainment and bulk detrainment. So what bulk entrainment really means, it's the cloud dilution more than anything. Not really the, it's not really quantifying how much mixing has occurred. It's quantifying how much the mixing has diluted the cloud and taken away its, its vigor or buoyancy. And what we see is that for the larger area bins, we have less bulk entrainment. So the clouds are staying more vigorous as they ascend. Now this trend kind of starts to weaken aloft and that's mainly because we just don't have a lot of clouds that get this high over the time period of analysis, two to three hours. I would, if, when I do extend this to later times, we see these profiles, the red line does, is, remains the smallest, but just for this period of time, it, uh, it doesn't, sh it, you know, aloft, the pattern kind of changes. Detrainment, we also see less detrainment from the clouds um, as the initial area increases. So this is estimated using uh, Betts's simple bulk plume method. And the way I did it was a very similar way to how I did the maximum buoyancy and W plots. I just um, kind of determined a, an epsilon and delta profile using the bulk plume method at each time. And then that became a new sample that was considered um, a, as part of the average, um, which were binned according to the initial area. So larger initial areas mean reduced mid-level core dilution and detrainment, and this is uh, consistent with the increased vertical velocity buoyancy and uh, water content of these clouds. If we instead bin the results on mass flux of the LFC, it's a similar story. It's not not quite as clear, but uh, you know it doesn't really change the story much. We see a particularly at mid levels, we see a progressive decrease in uh, cloud dilution and decrease in entrainment as um, this control variable mass flux of the LFC increases. Now, um, so when I'm talking talking about entrainment and detrainment, this is an issue. Uh, this is the uh, related to the cloud dilution, and I just want to say a couple words about that. And and this is. Um, a long-standing question for cloud physics and dynamics. And, you know, we really don't know very much about what controls cloud dilution. We have observational estimates, mainly from aircraft transects through clouds, which don't happen very often. And no matter how many you get, you'll never have a really good statistical coverage of many clouds in many different environments because aircraft are expensive. There are methods to um, retrieve cloud dilution, but they're pretty uncertain. Um, I've used them before and they, you know, over many, many clouds, they can tell you some signals, but, you know, on a cloud by cloud basis, these um, retrievals that can be done using ground-based instruments are not very accurate. Um, now we can use large eddy simulation where we have a full four-dimensional data set to uh, study this problem, but you can always say, well, you know, that's not reality. So we always have to verify that. And secondly, one can reach different conclusions from the same set of data. And this is in part because some of the sensitivities of dilution are to quantities that themselves are correlated. So you might, you can say, oh, you know, you can attribute um, a sensitivity to different processes and sort of get it wrong, <laughs> even though you have the data to tell that really would tell you the answer. The reason I'm getting into that is because these sensitivities of entrainment and detrainment are not trivial. You know, the, the larger area of the cloud may be the reason, or it could be a larger mass flux. You know, we, we really don't know. Um, the entrainment 
fractional entrainment is given by the total entrainment flux into the cloud over the, uh, the cloud mass flux. Now the entrainment, you can turn that into this equation where we take a loop integral. This is like a cloud, a cross section of a cloud at a given level. We do a loop integral around it of the uh, velocity, the normal velocity, uh, only summing over the inflow points. And we can then get a total entrainment amount. And then we normalize it by the mass flux, which is rho times W and this could be the core average W in, in the core area, which is also equal to the mass flux. So it might seem like, well, okay, if we increase the area, then we should see reduced entrainment or bulk entrainment. But it's not that simple because the enum as we change the denominator where the area appears, the numerator can change too. Um, and, and the same with, the, with W. But the, this mass flux sensitivity must be owing to either an area sensitivity or a vertical velocity sensitivity. So that's just a question that I haven't answered yet. So I found a negative correlation between um, dilution and the area at the LFC and the mass flux at the LFC. And so what that basically says is the denominator is dominating these variations. Now, it appears that the area effect might be more important, but studies have um, claimed one or the other that area is more important, that the sort of the area of the cloud is more important than the vertical velocity. Um, the area sensitivity has a simple and very appealing explanation that if you, if, if V prime dot N dot uh, DL doesn't change, then what we do is we're basically just integrating over the cloud perimeter in the numerator, and then we have cloud area in the denominator, which would induce a one over R dependence um, of entrainment. And so that's kind of the going, I think, I think that's what's believed by many, and I don't think these results contradict that. But I am working with Hugh Morrison um, to look more into these sensitivities like these, um, using to, uh, sort of different modeling frameworks to try to understand what really is controlling um, the dilution. Okay, so let's get back to the, the point uh, or get back to where we were before. I haven't explained everything, all the sensitivities that we have seen, you know, dilution, I'm sort of saying, well, it can go, it may or may not be one of two things and we have to look more. But there's also something that hasn't quite been resolved that I need to explain, which is we see that there's a big sensitivity to the cloud core area. Once we have terrain, we have larger areas. But we, among the different terrain cases, there isn't a large difference in the cloud area. But we still see a major difference in convection initiation, that, that it, it takes much longer for convection to initiate when there's a very rugged terrain. So it can't be only the cloud area that's, that's doing this. And I think my explanation for what's happening is that when you have larger scale terrain, the scales increase in space and they also increase in time. You know, we, that's how the atmosphere works. The time scale uh, and the space scale are closely linked. And so if we have larger scale terrain, um, it induces the circulations that it forms are longer lasting. And so the inflow into clouds, once the inflow starts, it can be a longer duration inflow. And that corresponds to more plume-like circulation. So this is a very simple picture of how a plume and a bubble might work. You know, a bubble is just a, a, an injection of mass into the cloud layer uh, coming from the subcloud layer. And that buoyancy basically, you know, is sort of like a shedding thermal that, that ascends uh, through the atmosphere or it ascends and it, and it has a cloud surrounding it because there's a lot of uh, air that's mixed with the environment, sort of well-entrained air surrounding it. And that's kind of the picture of a bubble. So it's the buoyant area region detaches from cloud base and, and ascends over time. But if we have a maintained source um, of mass or buoyancy, 
then we have a core that can extend from cloud base all the way up to near the cloud top. And this is obvious, this will be a less entrained cloud. Um, obviously, we'll also have more mass flux. So there's just more like area that is ascending. And when you have more mass flux, that means the cloud has a greater chance to ascend deeply um, because when more mass flux means there's just more, you can uh, lose more mass and still survive as, as the cloud uh, rises. So now comparing the very rugged terrain to the smoother terrain, you see that, you know, this is a very simple picture showing ups and downs of the terrain as if it was a simple air airflow over a corrugated boundary. Um, in an updraft, you'll get a cloud. And if the cloud has a similar scale as the scale of the terrain, then once the cloud forms, it's probably going to hit a downdraft pretty soon if it's moving. If the cloud has a much smaller scale than the terrain, then the cloud can, ex can experience ascent, forced ascent from the terrain for a longer time period, have more of a plume-like development, at least over some time, important time period of its growth. So what I do to test that idea is I um, just evaluate these larger clouds, not the smaller ones, because I'm really interested in comparing the different terrain cases, which all have some larger clouds, and to understand why KP1 has less deep convection than KM3 in particular. So I'm only considering clouds with initial areas greater than 2.5 times 10 to the sixth meters squared. Again, this is the, uh, the conceptual diagram, and then this is what we get. This is looking at mass flux over time, um, time series of mass flux. And what we see is the KP1 case, they all start off with similar mass fluxes, but the KP1 case, after about 10 minutes, it falls off. So its mass flux um, starts to decrease with time. Now, just to, to clarify what I'm showing here, this, these are averages over many clouds. So you might find that one cloud goes up and then way down to negative numbers, but once it becomes negative, it's no longer a, a core. Um, so you see this gradual decrease, which suggests that the cores are kind of not being supported um, as strongly once they form as in the KP1, as in the KM3 case, where the mass flux almost uh, monotonically increases with time. KM53 is in the middle. So you see it's a little bit of a drop off, but then it bounces back up. So it does appear that we're seeing less supported updrafts in the KP1 case, that, that it's sort of more like a bubble than a thermal, the KM3 being more like a thermal. And to, if you want to make this very simple, we can say, okay, we have an, I don't think this covers all possibilities in nature, but a very simple argument is just an advective timescale argument that in the KP1 case, a, a cloud can form over a mountain, but um, it has a limited, you know, it, it is then going to encounter a downdraft at about um, the, you know, within a wavelength of the terrain, uh, going, you know, because it's going up and down. And this terrain is, is has a peak at six delta x, 1.5 kilometers. KM3, the dominant, dominant forcing scale is 20 kilometers. That's all the way over here. And if we uh, calculate an advective time scale using three meters per second as, as the subcloud wind speed, which is the mean for the um, LBA case, we get an advective time scale of only 0.14 hours in KP1 and 1.85 hours in KM3, which is a 0.14, that's less than the life cycle of a typical cloud, and 1.85 is much more. And you kind of see that here. I mean, I don't want to take this too far, but 0.14 hours, let's say 0.15 hours, that's about 15 minutes. And this thing hits its peak, you know, a little after 10 minutes. Um, whereas KM3 just keeps going. Like, uh, it's just saying that, you know, there is the KP1 faces, each, each updraft faces kind of a headwind in the sense that the subcloud support dries up in a shorter period of time. Okay, and the remain, I don't have too much time left, um, which is unfortunate. And I'll, so I'll just run through a few sensitivity quest, uh, tests. Are the, are the results robust to grid refinement? We know 250 meters is marginal for LES, so let's try 125. Um, are the background winds important? I just gave a residence time argument, which depends on the presence of background winds. And is it something 
contrived about the way I'm doing my terrain power spectrum that's giving these results? You know, what if I try a very different approach? So I've done all of these, and this is what happens when um, we refine the grid. So I wasn't able to do the KP1 case at 125 meters because the, the model crashed. It was, the terrain was too steep, but you still see the same sensitivity. We see an, an enhancement in, uh, or promotion of convection initiation with the fastest initiation in the KM3 case. It takes a little bit longer for convection to develop. And um, I haven't looked into exactly why that is, but you have the combination of a bit more mixing into the boundary layers so that causes a bit more drying with time which can maintain sin for a bit longer. And then also we have smaller thermals, which tend to be less successful at higher resolution. Um, this is just looking at the profiles of buoyancy, vertical velocity, and uh, hydrometeors. We see the same sensitivity as before. It just doesn't extend as high because the convection is not as deep. This is again over the two to three hour period. So here, two to th when the time we get to three hours, we only have six kilometer deep convection. Looking at entrainment and detrainment, it's a similar story, um, but you can only really trust the results up to about three kilometers because very few clouds get above three kilometers uh, over the time period of this analysis. It's not as clear as the 250 meter case, but it's still there, the sensitivity to, um, of, of dilution to initial cloud area. Um, starting off with a zero initial wind, this is the result. So you might say, okay, this looks pretty similar. Uh, the only real difference is that convection initiates a bit faster um, and we see less sensitivity to the terrain spectrum actually and this is because that residence time argument doesn't actually hold when we have no background wind so i think it's just really the air cloud area effect that we're seeing here whereas this one had the area and the residence time effect then um, in response to a reviewer question they, they thought I was, was pulling a trick with my terrain spectra and suggested to just use the kappa to the minus five third spectra, but progressively remove scales. And so that's what I've done. And um, you can see that here. And then I rescale it to have the same amplitude. So the same relief in all cases. And what we see is that this was the original. Now here is these new simulations. As I remove forcing scales from the, spectrum, it becomes more rugged. And we see this systematic decrease uh, in convection initiation or in cloud vigor as we remove these larger scales. So we need the larger scales in there to promote the convection initiation. Um, I'll, I'll finish uh, talking about TMAX. This will be an opportunity to sort of test some of these ideas, particularly how updraft size and mass flux affect the fate of cumulus thermals. And we're thinking of uh, focusing on a, a Alpine TMAX is called the, well, I'm, I'm not going to, to spell out the acronym because I probably will get it wrong. So I won't do that, but um, it's taking place over the Alps it's a field campaign in 2024, 25. A lot of you probably know about it already. And what we're going to be doing with uh, studying convection is focusing down here um, in the Italian region specifically Monte Baldo, which is right next to Garda Lake. We just did a convection initiation climatology and found that there's this ring of, of intense convection initiation uh, on the Southern rim of the Alps. And so we wanna put some instruments right here and study uh, the formation of clouds. So with that said, I will conclude and uh, leave a bit of time for questions. Thank you. Great. Um, let's make, oh, can you please bring up, oh, oh yeah. uh, or I think Brett might bring up the Slido screen, but um, thank you, Dan, for uh, the insightful talk on uh, modeling convective initiation over complex terrain and then using the Amazon basin um, as a study uh, region. And we do have time for questions. Again, I'd like to remind people to please use the Slido interface, which is below your presentation screen, so please scroll down. Uh, we do have some questions. Let me highlight them in order. We have a question from Steve Onkley, and he asks, your TKE profiles seem to be a robust statistical difference due to terrain. Can you envision a field project involving profiles, radars, LIDARs, aircraft, occupied or not, that could verify this result? 
Thanks for the question. Um, I'll, I'll give a brief answer to it. Um, yeah, it does seem like um, higher, uh, more rugged terrain gives stronger TKE. I, I, I think this is something that we could probably um, evaluate. I mean, I don't even know if we need a field project. I mean, in part, we could use a, a, some stationary observations in different locations, some in more um, areas of more heterogeneous terrain versus smoother terrain. Of course, then the environment changes. Um, so you you know you'd have to have to be a climatological type of analysis. Um, I definitely think a field project would also be possible to fly at you know low levels. I'm particularly interested in the subcloud layer, so it becomes a little bit difficult to fly in the subcloud layer uh, over terrain and in, in a safe way. Um, but it would be nice to to fly within you know just. Uh, if we were to um, look at a mountain range, but different portions of the mountain range, say with, with the different uh, spectral properties of the terrain and sort of fly over these regions and look at the, the spatial uh, variation uh, or you know, compute the TKE uh, based on the spatial variation of the winds. So yes, I mean, I, I think that, that sounds like a relatively easy thing to observe, yeah. Well, I just actually have a follow-on question to that. Um, are there satellite measurements um, of cloud or aerosol properties that could provide some insight or validation? Um, in what, of what? Of some of the, of some of the um, cloud initiation parameters that you've been, um, that you're We've been trying to um, mm -hmm. sort of yeah. use as indicators of, of, of convective initiation, like your theta yeah. and your vertical velocities, and you know, um, looking at your things that can sort of provide some validation to your power spectrums. Yeah, I mean, um, that's. I think satellites can be helpful. I mean, one what you'll what we can get from satellites is is. Uh, if we have cloud radars in space, we can get vertical velocity inside clouds before they precipitate. And when we're looking at uh, convection initiation, we have to be thinking about the time period before precipitation starts. So spaceborne radars may not be terribly useful uh, to look at that time period, but uh, this, the um, I, I think what what could be useful is is that the the satellites can see the cloud development. Even the GOES-17 now has a high enough resolution to make out smaller cumuli, not, not the smallest ones, but smaller ones. And so, you know, we could, there could be statistical comparisons of different regions, like, you know, where do clouds, you know, if we can um, sort of control for the environmental conditions, where do the clouds form first? Where, where do they deepen first? You know, like looking at, at how the uh, smaller scale terrain, um, if, you know, regulates that. It would take some thought, <laughs> but I'm, I'm not really sure like what, how much vertical velocity we can get from space if we can actually measure boundary layer uh, dry motions from space. That would be quite a LIDAR if we could. So, a little bit. I'm I'm a bit limited in what I know we can measure from space. Same with you. Um, <laughs> we have uh, two questions from um, Tim Cruz, and his first question is: I'm curious if similar uh, spatial variations in surface friction would have a similar encouragement of convective initiation for flows with some mean level low level flow. Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's a it's a it, hi, Chris, by the way. Um, it's a scaling, it, it's, it's merely that you, that through the surface, scales are being imposed on the, the boundary layer flow that then reach the boundary layer top and affect the size of the cloud. So absolutely, um, you know, studies have been done. I'm not aware of studies where surface friction was varied in this way, but I, I am familiar with studies where the uh, land surface type was varied 
in a you know in a systematic way where you have patches of different size and it, the results are pretty similar uh, to what I found here. So you know larger size um, surface heterogeneities tend to force larger clouds and those larger clouds tend to grow faster. And uh, has a, an, another, a second question from Chris is, do turbulent characteristics above the LFC have influences on cloud dilution? Is cloud dilution primarily determined, uh, is cloud dilution pr pr primarily determined uh, by cloud properties at the LFC? Uh, the answer is yes and no. I mean, yes to the first question, no to the second. Yes, turbulence above, uh, you know, inside the cloud layer is super important. I mean, that's what's really, that's, the, those processes are accomplishing the cloud dilution. Um, the question is, are there property, are there initial properties that are predictive, despite the fact that there are important processes happening in the cloud layer? I would say the cloud, di cloud dilution I, I can't say that cloud dilution is primarily determined by cloud properties at the LFC, but what I've shown you is that if you bin based on cloud properties at the LFC, you see a strong sensitivity. So I, I can't say it goes the opposite way. You know that that once we know cloud dilution, we we can predict the properties at the LFC. Um, all I'm I have just am studying the forward problem here. But that's a good question, and, and that that's actually related to the work uh, that I mentioned that I'm doing, collaborating with you on. Um, we're trying to get to the to the bottom of this without thinking of um, initial properties, but really more instantaneous relationships be between dilution and, um, you know, the say the area of a cloud at a given level and the dilution occurring at that level. So you know, we're trying to get to the root of it. Um, I, but I can't really tell you uh, the answer to the second question because I don't know. Thank you, Chris, for both of those excellent questions. Um, we have um, a question from Peter Sullivan, also from M Cubed, and he asks, does anisotropic terrain matter? Yeah. Hi, Peter. Um, yes, I assume it does. Uh, <laughs> I, ha I mean, I do think anisotropic terrain is important because we have these river valleys that channel a lot of flow. You know, if you just have a amplitude, you know, if you're designing terrain with random amplitudes, then really you just get kind of bumps here and there and there's no structure to it. And in real terrain, you have these, these river valleys and I think they organize the flow, they channel the flow and I, they, at least it's, very plausible that they lead to stronger, uh, locally stronger circulations than having more isotropic terrain. So my guess is that anisotropic terrain is is favorable. Um, that's something you know favorable for can for uh, well I would say is more would promote convection initiation more effectively for all else equal than isotropic terrain. But that's something that would be uh, a nice thing to try to study explicitly. You're very popular today, Dan. Um, Am I? <laughs> so we, we have actually two questions that are related to each other. So I'm actually going to leave it up like this. So we have one from, of course, the famous infamous George Bryan. And he says, hi, Dan, nice work. What are the spectral properties of the terrain over the areas you showed at the beginning of your talks in Mississippi, Ohio, Quebec? Mm -hmm. the, what are your kappas? And then yeah. the follow-on question from that is from Jimmy Dudia. He said, related to George's question, do spectra typically have a peak near 20 kilometers? Okay. Um, I, I can't answer George's question because I haven't done the analysis on those terrains. I, that I actually uh, made those plots uh, just today and um, didn't do the, F I, I didn't uh, analyze it. I'm never sure, you know, I'm, I'm always a little bit unsure of how to 
do an analysis of a terrain, as, you know, a Fourier analysis when the terrain itself is not periodic. Um, so I, you know, didn't just rush and do those spectra, but I think there's there have been uh, observations, not just mine, but but numerous observations showing terrain tends to follow something like a kappa to the minus two. Um, so <laughs> that's all I can say about that. Um, and then uh, Jimmy Duty uh, question. No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that spectra typically have a peak near 20 kilometers. What I was trying to do is um, I was thinking of, you know, kind of a grid box size in a model and what is the subgrid terrain? Uh, you know, let's say a model has a grid, spa a grid spacing of 20 kilometers. Um, that's the sort of subgrid terrain that you'd really care about. That those are the scales that you'd really care about. So, uh, you know, I didn't mention this, but 20 kilometers was kind of, I kind of viewed that as, well, if uh, the scale's larger than 20 kilometers, I would consider to be, you know, larger scale terrain, not, uh, sort of small scale uh, variability. So that's why I chose 20 kilometers. It was an arbitrary choice. Um, and I can't say that spectra typically have a peak at that scale. The one I saw, the one I've looked at from the Oregon coastal range didn't have, uh, I didn't find a peak you know, in, the, in the data, it just increased monotonically as, uh, with wavelength. You know, the larger the wavelength, the more power. Um, we have a question from Morris who asked, have you considered adding boundary layer roles to your terrain considerations? Hi, Morris. Um, I think you mean, I think the roles you mean uh, R-O-L-L-S. Otherwise I don't understand. But I think that's, I, um, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I've looked at, I've tried to look at boundary layer roles initiating convection for some time, and I always start looking at it, and I and I kind of reach the conclusion that um, I have difficulty finding a good, strong relationship between the scales and structure of boundary layer roles uh, in convection initiation, other than it's just basically showing when it gets larger, you'd expect. Uh, faster initiation again because there is forcing at larger scales. Um, but I, th I think that would, you know, I don't see boundary layer roles in my simulations because the winds are too weak. But that that is uh, a parameter that would induce additional um, sort of micro to mesoscale variability that can help to initiate convec, you know, can can help to produce forcing at larger scales. And yes, Morris did reply again, and he did mean roles with double L. Okay, thank you, good. For, thank you for that qualifier. And I think we're going to finish um, with a, a final comment from Chris uh, saying, I think global terrain power spectra follows a minus two slope. We enjoyed the talk. It was a very good talk. So thank you, uh, Chris, for that. And we are past the seminar. We are past the seminar hour. If you are interested in Dan's presentation, and I'm sure a number of you are, and you have further questions, please reach out to him by his email, which is provided on the seminar flyer. So on behalf of EOL, and I'm sure NQ does well, I would like to thank Dr. Daniel Kirschbaum on his excellent and informative presentation um, on convective initiation over complex terrain using Amazon Basin as a case study. Thank you, everyone, and have a great day. Thanks for coming, everyone. And thanks, Jackie, for organizing it.